It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, despite uh, being in the far north. But I have far, as I will explain in a moment, I have far northern origins myself <coughs> of various kinds. So uh, being in the far north is at home to me. And I already feel very at home here, so it's a double pleasure. And people have made me feel very at home, so uh, thank you for all of that. Um, what I want to do today, I was a little bit debate. I was debating whether or not to give a talk today of a more formal academic kind. But I have, in my cowardly, lazy way, I hope you won't see this as a developing character trait, uh, backed off of that. And I thought, for various reasons, I just today give you some sense of my own background, tell you a little bit about myself, because it's a chance for us, for me to get to know you, and in particular for you to get to know something about me. Um, Tell you something about my background, my education, uh, my philosophical interests, and then give you a kind of general description of my uh, research interests, how they've developed, how they're related, in particular how they're related to the project, which is a very exciting project. I'm absolutely delighted about that. And I should say, just on top of everything else, how grateful I am to the department, uh, my colleagues here, for nominating me for this really wonderful, wonderful award. Um, I still look at the amount and uh, feel both excited and frightened. <laughs> um, I will say something about the responsibility of responsibility here. Um, but um, So I want to say something about that. I want to give you some sense of that. Uh, maybe if we get a chance, I certainly welcome any questions, uh, discussion if people have particular uh, questions to ask or uh, comments to make, suggestions to make, whatever, I'd be interested. Um, and then talk a little bit about the project itself, uh, why, the, why the project is significant, uh, what I think our opportunities are, and possibilities are, and our op maybe a little bit about our options. So um, it's hard to make this very exciting. It's not philosophy. It's my life. And uh, I've, I've got this excitement of the camera on me and the microphone and my uh, technology working here, but uh, the, everything else will now start to be the content, maybe an anticlimax. But let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I don't know how you, what you hear in my accent. Uh, I'm a little bit complicated, as I say, with my northern background. I was born in Scotland. I'm from Glasgow. Uh, I um, left Scotland like a lot of Scots uh, for North America. Um, I went uh, as a small child. My dad was actually an My father was an academic, and my mother was an academic. My father was a philosopher as well. So I'm part of the family business. Um, and my father took a job briefly um, in the Midwest of the United States, in Kansas. And there's a little bit of a funny story about that, because um, um, the reason we went there was my father got to know somebody, Edward Robinson, who some of you, if you work in Heidegger, will know is one of the trans translators of the English translation of Heidegger's Being in Time with John Macquarie. John Macquarie was a colleague of my father's at Glasgow. So I like to think that I was uh, ended up in the Midwest of the United States briefly as a small child because of Heidegger's Being in Time. Um, so I was thrown there. Uh, and then I was shortly after that thrown right back out. <laughs> so we kind of uh, arrived at a kind of middle position. I grew up in Canada. Uh, some of you may have visited there, may know I grew up in a city, Kingston. My parents taught at Queen's University in Kingston, which is between Toronto and Montreal in Ontario. And I began my undergraduate work there. Uh, and I did my first degree, started off in philosophy. I was interested in philosophy and history, politics, that kind of thing. And I then returned to my other, nor my northern roots in Scotland. I came back and I was an, um, the reason for this actually was completely uh, non-academic. It was my wife, who's from Edinburgh. My wife Kate is here, you meet her hopefully over time. Uh, so I came back to be with Kate uh, and joined the undergraduate program at Edinburgh, which was a bit of a risky thing to do, to be honest, because it was the old fashioned uh, Scottish system, which was quite a kind of tough examination system, but I survived. Uh, and probably that's where my serious academic uh, interests of various kinds started to take shape. 
Um, they actually took uh, shape in ways I wasn't really aware. Of course, I studied in the David Hume Tower, which I have to say is a pretty unimpressive building, if you know it. Kind of disappointing for poor old David Hume. Um, they knocked down a beautiful 18th century square and put up this terrible 1960s anonymous uh, building and then called it after him, really quite criminal. So it became clear, I wasn't aware of this, but obviously my Hume background, my Scottish background started to uh, take shape there. So that became a fairly dominant interest. But actually when I, um, I went down to Cambridge to start my graduate work at Cambridge, this was in the early 1980s, a socially and politically exciting time. Mrs. Thatcher was doing interesting things to British academic life there, and it was kind of an interesting period to be in Britain, not just academically, but uh, philosophically, uh, politically and socially. Um, and my, my initial work, what I was really interested in was the Marxist theory of history. So I had studied, uh, I was interested then in the, um, the philosophy of history. And again, it's a sign, I guess, suppose, of how things have changed. The philosophy of history, of history then, my tutor at Edinburgh is a man called W.H. Walsh, who some of you may know is also important in that field, important Kant scholar. The philosophy of history has sort of slightly died as a field, unfortunately. Um, so maybe I made a wise choice. I segued out of it. But I was quite interested in problems of uh, freedom and moral responsibility as it related to deterministic theories of history, in particular the Marxist theory of history. And I worked with G.A. Cohen, Jerry Cohen, who some of you may know, uh, was a very influential analytic Marxist at the time. Of, he was a student of Isaiah Berlin's. Jerry was a great character. We had our, Jerry was uh, from Montreal. We had a Canadian background in common, so he was lots of fun. And if you know a little bit about Jerry, you know he was a kind of crazy, zany uh, person as well as uh, a very good philosopher. So I was very lucky in that. But um, Jerry was actually the person who pointed out to me that uh, my interests really, uh, my Scottish background was showing up, uh, and I had more to say that was uh, interesting on Hume than on Marx. So it was Jerry's influence that sort of got me moving in that direction. So my PhD in Cambridge really started to focus on um, Hume, on free will, moral responsibility, and that kind of area of Hume's ethics. And by then I started to work with Bernard Williams. Who I went back to Cambridge and was working with Williams, um, who was a terrific supervisor and hugely influential. And I will come back to that still. I'm still very interested in Williams' work. So uh, all of this, this was really consolidated. The reason I say this is that um, this is quite an important period for me because um, it sort of reflects really, I think, my, my fundamental philosophical character and interests were shaped in this period. So they're partly historical, early modern philosophy, primarily Hume, uh, that kind of area, but also in relation to problems, contemporary problems of freedom and, mor and moral responsibility. So those two really came together in my thesis itself. And most of what I've done, in some sense, goes back to that period. So that's probably not that unusual, but that's how it is here. Um, before I go on, I really what I want to do is just give you a sense of my research in terms of those two, if you want, poles of my interest. My interest in the history of philosophy and Hume, and my interest in moral responsibility and problems of freedom in relation to that. Um, but just in terms of what happened to me after Cambridge, I then uh, got, went back. Again, as I was saying to you, it was uh, Britain in the 1980s, maybe like Britain now. Uh, there weren't many jobs, uh, so I was back, and I uh, was really quite lucky. I got a job at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, in the West Coast. And so I've been there uh, ever since the late 1980s. And um, I've visited various places in America at various times. I've been very lucky. I've had a chance to go to places like uh, Virginia and Stanford and uh, Pittsburgh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, places of that sort. So um, that's really my kind of academic background and trajectory uh, from a professional point of view. Um, but what I'd like to do is say a little bit uh, to you about my research interests as it came out of that kind of basic structure or framework that I was telling you about. Um, the project, of course, is on one side, it's about moral responsibility. And, uh, but I also have this other side to me. I, in truth, I'm probably as well known for my work on Hume, perhaps better known for my work on Hume right now than I am 
and moral responsibility as such. Um, in the sense that my two major projects are both, uh, my two major books are both about uh, Hume, uh, Hume's philosophy. So the first book was uh, Freedom and Moral Sentiment, uh, which was a discussion of, uh, that came out of the thesis. Um, and the second book is The Riddle of Hume's Treatise, which is about the general interpretation of Hume's treatise of human nature. So if this isn't too tedious, let me just give you a quick sketch of what they're about so you at least know what those, those two works are, are on about. Roughly, um, in the case of Hume, um, it became clear to me that Hume wasn't properly, you know, Hume is probably regarded as the classical statement of the compatibilist position. If you're teaching uh, introductory philosophy and you're teaching the problem of free will and moral responsibility, you're teaching compatibilism, you probably use Hume as a point of entry into the subject. He's the kind of foundation for it. And I'm, as I'm sure most of you have been exposed to, certainly I was uh, exposed to as an undergraduate, the idea was there was a kind of standard classical compatibilist position that had to do with the reconciliation, the logic of freedom and necessity. Uh, roughly, that properly understood liberty and necessity weren't in conflict with each other. They were conceptually uh, perfectly consistent. It was just that if you had a faulty understanding of liberty, as Hume puts it, being opposed to necessity or opposed to causation and necessity, then you run into problems. And Hume tries to give this kind of um, 18th century piece of conceptual analysis, which other people later on, like Moore, Schlick, Russell, so on and so forth, A.J. Eyre, they, that's the classical compatibilist position. It's got a kind of forward-looking view about moral responsibility, and that's the way the reconciliation project or the compatibilist position is supposed to work. The focus of that is the logic, if you want, the conceptual analysis of con the relationship between concepts of freedom, causation and necessity, and responsibility, and that's the way it's structured. My work in freedom and moral sentiment is really to argue that, in fact, this misunderstands what Hume is doing in these passages, and really it's fundamentally to misunderstand some very important aspects of Hume's moral philosophy and ethics in general. Roughly, the idea is that what, when Hume is talking about conditions of moral responsibility, he's interested in the way the moral sentiments are generated, sentiments of approval, disapproval, praise, and blame. Those for Hume are what he would call calm forms of love and hate, if you want moralized love and hate. And what I try to do in this book is explain the way in which um, Hume's moral psychology is what informs the reconciliation project. Roughly, the idea is that <clears throat> unless you have an agent is acting with liberty of spontaneity, where an agent's acting according to the determination of his or her own will, we can't make an inference to their mind, and then we can't generate a moral sentiment of the right kind. Similarly, we need necessity to be true, where necessity is understood as regularity and an inference from one object to another in order to make the kinds of inferences that are necessary to produce the moral sentiments, indeed to uh, make the mechanism of the indirect passions work in general. So in one way, it's quite close uh, analysis. But what I really try to do is that's, that's the, if you want, the textual interpretive aspect. But the second part of the book is I try to explain that this is actually, although it looks like it's very arcane 18th century moral psychology, it actually has a very important implication because what it shows is that Hume is actually anticipating very central threads of P.F. Strawson's hugely influential paper, Freedom and Resentment. So again, as you, and I'll say more about Freedom and Resentment because this is really my contemporary interest in moral responsibility is very much informed by that. I've been sort of trying to, in that historical work, make the linkage between Hume and contemporary Strawsonian naturalism understood in these terms and develop that theory. So if you want, the interpretive issue has a huge critical bite and critical significance. And then I pursue that in this book on various issues. Some of you, I know, work in these areas on punishment, luck, uh, moral psychology, various aspects of that sort, religion, all of that kind of thing. So that's Freedom, Freedom and Moral Sentiment. That was published in 1995. Um, the other book, uh, in a way, actually grew out of this. Roughly, the, the idea that here is with the riddle of Hume's treatise, which is about the relationship between skepticism, naturalism, and irreligion in Hume's philosophy. That's the fundamental concern. Um, I was interested in Hume's relationship to Hobbes, 
uh, on the free will topic, because for the reasons I was just telling you, Hume is often usually identified with Hobbes on liberty and necessity. They're usually both seen as classical British compatibilists. So I got interested in that relationship. And the short version of this is, you know, there's, um, the treatise is probably uh, regarded, or certainly I regard it, as the most important, the most influential single work in English-speaking philosophy. Maybe a few other books can rival that, like Locke's essay or something like that. But I think the treatise is really particularly important. As you know, it has influence on almost every topic of contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of ri the riddle is about these two fundamental themes. You know, there's a, one interpretation of Hume that goes all the way back is that Hume was a radical skeptic who tried to show that if you ground uh, human knowledge and human under understanding on empiricist principles, it leads to you know, uh, radical, systematic, skeptical conclusions about our fundamental common sense beliefs about the world. And he erodes the foundations for human knowledge and human understanding. So there's the classical skeptical reading. To some extent, Kant took that on board and perpetuated it. Um, then in the early 20th century, there was an influential Scottish uh, uh, scholar, uh, Norman Kemp Smith, also a great Kemp scholar, um, who proposed a naturalistic interpretation, which is supposed to emphasize roughly in, on Kemp Smith's account the importance of feeling over reason in Hume's philosophy. And the general suggestion was Hume isn't simply a skeptic, but he's a naturalist under a particular kind of interpretation. And one aspect of that naturalism, which is now hugely influential when it comes to Hume scholarship and indeed philosophy in general, is the idea of Hume as being the Newton of the moral sciences, laying the foundations for a more scientific philosophy and a scientific uh, understanding of uh, the, the moral sciences. Um, then the puzzle is, how do these two parts fit together? Because Hume is seemingly both a radical skeptic and he aspires to making a contribution to the uh, uh, science of human nature or moral science. So what's going on here? It looks like it's not just a tension or a fragmentation in Hume's project, but there's a fundamental incoherence. So my book, The Riddle of Hume's Treatise, is an effort to try and explain and uh, provide a coherent interpretation that gets out of that problem. And very briefly, um, the idea here is that um, Hume is advancing an irreligious project. So you have probably, if you were interested in Hume at all, you've probably heard the famous thing that Hume castrated the treatise, cutting off its nobler parts uh, because he was worried he would cause offense to the religious and the orthodox. This is the, Bishop Butler was the target of these kinds of worries. Um, and so the claim has always been, and this has been accepted by almost all the parties, all the scholars, those that Hume's treatise has little or nothing to do with religion at all. So, Roughly what my project is about is arguing that the opposite is true. Hume is fundamentally concerned right from the beginning in the treatise, systematically all the way through with problems of religion where he is arguing and advancing an irreligious or an atheistic agenda. The idea here is that it's to the, the structure of the treatise is actually structured after Hobbes' own science of man or science of human nature. And Roughly, Hobbes's project is one to provide a secular scientific account of ethical and political life. And if you know, again, if you're interested in Hobbes, you know that Hobbes raised a lot of problems about the relationship between philosophy and theology. Roughly, Hobbes's view was that uh, the two should be kept completely separate, and that philosophy, as it were, raised fundamental problems, skeptical problems for all theological knowledge uh, as a claims of reason or claims to be grounded in human understanding. Hume's project, essentially, on the interpretation, the irreligious interpretation I advance, is basically on one side the constructive naturalistic project is to provide, if you want, a kind of semi-Hobbist uh, account of the science of human nature, a secular scientific account of uh, moral and political life. And on the negative side, it's a skeptical attack on systems of uh, religious systems, Christian systems of metaphysics and morals. There's a lot in my book, in that book, it is very scholarly. There's a lot about the 18th century context and the importance of the radical enlightenment. And to be honest, a lot of my work has been very historically and scholarly oriented in that way, particularly in that book. So um, certainly that book proposes a, a, a fundamental and radical rethink of Hume's philosophy in general. And so I'm working on stuff related to that right now, and I expect that 
to continue in some form or other. I'm, right now I'm editing a collection for Oxford, the Oxford Handbook on Hume, and I have, have those kind of scholarly interests. But all of that is not really primarily what you, we're here for. We're here for the stuff and more responsibility. So I'll go back to that if I can and just sort of uh, uh, explain why, um, how this all works. All the way through these projects, I've maintained an interest in contemporary problems of freedom and free will and moral responsibility. So I've been publishing continuously. As you all know, if you do this kind of thing, it's hard because you've got to keep a lot of balls juggling up in the air and trying to keep uh, involved in the way I would like. Um, I've always really, if, to, to be frank, my primary uh, philosophical interests have always been in moral responsibility and problems of free will. So that's really where I find my philosophical energy comes from. So I'm particularly pleased to be able to come here and pursue that project. Um, and really what I want to do is have the opportunity to bring together a lot of the work that I have been doing over the years that comes out of these projects I'm describing and put it all together. This is really where my own work will be going while I'm here. So I have a few papers that probably would just give you some idea of the sort of interests I have. So I think one of, one of the more important, one of the more influential papers I wrote was on um, Strawson's way of naturalizing responsibility which is a paper I wrote, in, it was published in the early 90s. And it's a, I'm in an odd, odd position, which is I'm actually very sympathetic to the Strawsonian program in Freedom and Resentment, if you know this work. Work which is supposed to be a way of appealing to what Strawson calls reactive attitudes or moral sentiments. As I said to you, this is very Humean. As a way of trying to diffuse the skeptical threat about um, a skeptical threat about the implications of determinism for freedom and moral responsibility. This is Strawson's program in Freedom and Resentment. Um, the problem is, I argue in this paper, is that none of the central arguments in Strawson's Freedom and Resentment actually work, unfortunately. They run into serious problems. So this gives you some sense of where I stand on Strawson. Is I think Strawson's paper is a hugely, for me, it's the most important paper that's come out of the late 20th century, and that influence is gathering into the 21st century. Um, it's massively important work. It actually reflects a change in the way we do philosophy. You know, it's not conceptual um, analysis and of the sort that we're talking about in relation to classical compatibilism. It um, appeals primarily to the importance of moral psychology for understanding these philosophical issues as they relate to problems of justification and the threat of skepticism. And that's really what Strassen is trying to do. So it's a paper that really actually has philosophical significance in terms of this change of methodology. If you want the change to more naturalistic, um, empirically informed moral psychology. Um, but as I say, uh, my attitude to this is that although the Strassonian, Strassonian program is on the right tracks, methodologically and in terms of its resources, the particular arguments don't work. So then the question is, how can that program be reconstructed or redeveloped? So that's really what I've been, in some form or other, been working on for the last, whatever, uh, many years. Um, so some of the contributions are about the conditions, what's required for a responsible agent, a res an agent who is a legitimate, appropriate target of reactive attitudes or moral sentiments, or if you want, an agent who we can legitimately hold responsible. So... As you probably know, there's been a lot of work with people like Daniel Dennett, John Fisher, R.J. Wallace, Susan Wolfe, people of this sort, very important, very influential uh, people in this area, to develop roughly, if you want, a kind of reasons responsive theory of the, of, uh, the basic capacities required for moral responsibility, to be a responsible agent who's a legitimate, appropriate target who we can hold responsible. The idea there is to, as it were, fill a major gap in the Strassonian program because Strassen really doesn't have anything or anything substantial enough to say about what the, capaci the relevant capacities of responsible agents are supposed to be. So that's a huge area of activity and very important. And that's where a lot of the most exciting work has been going on in the last, I would say, last 30 years. Um, the problem is that I, as it were, I, I've tried to advance some views about what's exactly required for that reasons responsive view. One of them is that I argue that for agents to be reasons responsive, they must also have the capacity to hold themselves responsible, understood as a capacity to feel and entertain reactive attitudes themselves. 
So this has now become quite an important issue in the field, which is the relationship between what being a responsible agent and holding agents responsible. In other words, what's the relationship between if you, the reactive attitude side understood as playing a key part in the analysis of holding agents responsible? And what's involved in understanding agents being responsible in terms of their reasons responsiveness? And at least an important part of some, some of my work uh, that's uh, been developed over, the, over time in relation to Hume and in relation to Strawson is to argue that there's actually an intimate relationship between those two components. They're not separate. Somebody who keeps them separate is R.J. Wallace. If, again, if you know Wallace's work, he's a hugely influential figure in this area. Wallace has probably published the most uh, influential kind of uh, quasi or neo strassonian program in his work, Responsibility in the Moral Sentiments. It's a book I think extremely highly of, but I also disagree with. The part I disagree with, you won't be surprised to hear, is that he tries to sort of weave a Kantian theory of agency onto his Humean Strassonian theory of responsibility. I'm skeptical about that. So actually that's, again, some of my more recent work has been criticizing Wallace's program, his particular narrow conception of responsibility. Roughly what Wallace tries to do is redefine reactive attitudes in a narrow, more restricted way than Strawson did. He sees Strawson's naturalism, as it were, too liberal, too generous in terms of his understanding of what reactive attitudes are. And that for Wallace, this generates all kinds of problems about the strength of uh, uh, Strawson's uh, naturalistic claims. And while I actually think a lot of Wallace's criticisms are um, uh, well-founded, and there's much to be said for them, I'm sympathetic to them, I, I think his effort to solve these problems on the basis of the, this critical analysis runs into its own difficulties, and I um, have raised various problems with that, suggesting that what we have to find, roughly my critique there is that Wallace is somebody who, in Bernard Williams' language, um, is a proponent of the morality system. So this is me coming full square back to my philosophical origins with my supervisor that I mentioned earlier on. Um, the compatibilism that I want to defend is, from one point of view, Strassonian, although it is critical of the original Strassonian program. I try to identify what the central problems are. I then try to work out what the alternative sort of strategies are in terms of constructive accounts of uh, moral capacities that are required of appropriate uh, targets of reactive attitudes or moral sentiments. And then I try to, as it were, respond to other suggested uh, views like Wallace's that are rooted in the morality system. So this brings me, if you want, the tone of this, if this helps position my work, um, brings me into the kind of orbit of people like Bernard Williams, who um, is, as you know, deeply skeptical about the Kantian system, particularly as it um, um, represents the morality, what Williams calls the morality system, which places emphasis on key concepts like obligation, blame, and voluntariness. So my theory of responsibility is, in this sense, Humean, Strassonian, and Williams-esque. And my interest in Williams shows that um, while I'm not, say, to the extent that Gunnar and others here will be interested in meta-ethics, I do have a strong interest in ethical theory in certain dimensions and components as it integrates with this, these issues of moral responsibility and free will. So, and again, I've got, you know, uh, particular papers. Gunnar this afternoon is giving a talk for those of the, who are involved in the practical ethics group on um, manipulation arguments. I have my own line on manipulation arguments. Um, I maybe abandon it this afternoon. I'll see. Um, and um, so I've got various components of that. What I'm hoping to do is bring this all together. This is why it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here from my own selfish point of view, but I hope that this will be able to infuse into the group here. Um, the project I've got, and I've described this as sort of in a nutshell, is I'm writing a book called, uh, I've got a title, that's a good, good sign, you'll be very encouraged by that, um, called The Limits of Free Will. So it's a compatibilist position, but the oddity is, as you know, if you read people, if you know Dennett's work, it's a paradigm, he's a kind of paradigm compatibilist of the sort that I want to distance myself. He's an optimist. So I'm interested not just in the issue between um, skeptics and anti-skeptics, but also between optimists and pessimists. And you know, the very simple model is that usually the view is, if we can defeat the skeptical challenge, then we can vindicate the optimistic position. 
The question is, what does that require? Does it require libertarian, indeterministic metaphysics, or can it be done with incompatibilist, con deterministic constraints? So you know, if you know Dennett's work, he is a kind of hyper-optimist. I think I unkindly call him a Pollyanna in one of my papers. He thinks everything's more or less fine, that it's all, we're kind of panicking over stuff. But my view is actually the opposite. I am a compatibilist pessimist. My Scottish, gloomy, Calvinist, mean-spiritedness comes right back in my uh, fundamental views on the problem of responsibility and freedom. Um, so roughly my line is this, is that um, the, the position I want to develop is one which compatibilists acknowledge incompatibilist concerns about fate and luck, which I argue are inescapable. But for me, the position I want to develop, and I regard this as consistent with aspects of Williams, maybe even aspects of Nietzsche, because as you know, you know Williams' stuff, it's influenced by Nietzsche. <clears throat> the position I want to develop is that we can give a coherent, credible account, if you want a robust account, of conditions of freedom and moral responsibility. But they nevertheless are consistent with the fact that agents who satisfy those standards and those conditions are free and morally responsible are still subject to fate and luck. That means changing the way we understand the problem, because there's a kind of general demand that all the established parties, whether they be libertarians, compatibilists, or skeptics, all assume that whatever the answer is, it has to be one that if we can vindicate conditions of freedom and responsibility, we can um, show that, as it were, this threat uh, of freedom and luck can be removed, uh, sorry, of uh, fate and luck can be removed, and we aren't subject to fate and luck. I argue that's not true. So compatibilists for me are people, uh, I call it one way of putting this is compatibilists of any plausible kind have to accept that they're compatibilist fatalists, that that has pessimistic implications. We can't vindicate optimism. And in particular, we can't vindicate the particular conception of moral responsibility that's um, um, advanced or aimed at or aspired to by the morality system, which has a particular conception of agency and the requirements of free agents and responsibility. So that is my um, that's where my work is going. A lot of that is done in some form or other. Really, I think it's fair to say that my main project while I'm here and, uh, is to bring that together. That's why having an opportunity to work with people in the group and uh, the people who will, will be bringing in give me a chance to really get some good feedback and criticism and hopefully stimulate other people in relation to that and hear what people are doing. So as you can see from that, my, my approach on, in re moral responsibility is the theoretical side, the kind of moral psychology and the structure of it and how it relates to problems of justification, skepticism, naturalism, all of that. I know that many people in the group are actually more on the applied side. So maybe now I could just say something about the project itself just for five minutes to give you um, some sense of what, what I make of the project and the um, Swedish Research Council Award and why it's significant for us. Um, I think the area of uh, moral responsibility right now, and if you want the way it integrates or intersects with problems of free will, is hugely exciting right now. Those of you who even just have an informal interest in that will know that there's so much going on. And roughly, I would say from the theoretical point of view, I would categorize it in three. There are three sort of areas. There's the main area that my own work comes out with, which is coming out of traditional problems of conditions of uh, moral responsibility, um, uh, excusing theory of excuses and exemptions related to, and that obviously relates to problems in the law, criminal justice, things of that sort. So we're concerned to identify what a responsible agent is and to give some proper adequate account of it, how we understand uh, issues of excuses, mitigation, so on and so forth in relation to that. All of that actually has deep roots in, also in theology, by the way. I've not really said anything about that, but some of you might be interested in that, and I have some historical interest in that as well. Um, so that's the kind of traditional problem, the traditional theoretical problem comes out of that. And it's massively important for understanding how our, our relationships with one another. And so we have ongoing problems in the law with that in terms of um, issues of deprivation, social deprivation. To what extent does that excuse or mitigate um, uh, agents who are brought before the courts, that sort of thing. Issues about genetics and ge genetic determination, all of that. <clears throat> 
There are also issues about collective responsibility, and that is now almost a separate area in itself. That has kind of taken off in the last 10 to 15 years. And there are various aspects of that, understanding uh, collective agency, shared agency, and how we understand uh, and interpret those conditions, how it relates to individual responsibility, and the analysis of those issues. Um, all of that has obviously massive social and political importance in terms of problems of the environment, problems of business ethics, things of that sort, um, problems of uh, international justice and responsibility. Um, and then the third area where there's a huge amount of activity, um, and I think actually right now probably the most activity is neuroscience. This is the way philosophy has gone from being conceptual and a priori to now more and more and more and more scientific. Um, I'm a little bit of a reluctant partner to some of that, to be honest with you. We could discuss that. Um, I think it can go too far. Um, but it's hugely interesting, and it's hugely influential. And it's some, of the, uh, some of the discussions are very exciting. Um, so roughly, you know, uh, the work here of people who are influential are people like Libet, um, uh, who argues that, in fact, uh, you know, experimental data shows that we're really not, um, we're, we're not, our conscious decisions aren't what drives us. It's our brains making the decision. I, the conscious agent doesn't do it. The brain does it. And uh, this has introduced a certain uh, people, Libet's a slightly more complicated case, but he's a skeptic up to a point. But some people have argued for a deep skepticism on the basis of these experimental results to suggest that with the, the conditions of responsible agency aren't possible to satisfy. More popular, very popular influential work, people like Sam Harris, if you know his uh, recent book on free will, it, I find it sheer, I have sheer envy when I look at his uh, Amazon sales numbers. He's massively popular. I think it's a terrible and skeptical argument, to be honest with you, but he's hugely influential, and I guess he's got a great um, ability to reach a large audience and excite a lot of people with the idea that there, we aren't really free, responsible agents at all. Well, I'm skeptical about the skepticism for reasons I've just explained, but there's an enormous amount of exciting work there and very important influ influential people who hopefully we can bring in in all of those dimensions. And one of the things I will be discussing with people when I'm here and as we work through this is how we can satisfy those various components and integrate them together. There's also the way of bringing those particular theoretical components and integrating them with the applied practical stuff that's got to do with institutional structures. And that is also very important and very influential. And in fact, there's probably um, a need for us to be responsive to that dimension and not just be stuck in the theoretical work in, a, in, a, in a, an exclusive way. So, for me, obviously, that, uh, that's where I will hope to contribute into those areas, to connect with my colleagues and uh, pr uh, pr hopefully provide for them and provide some leadership with my own work. Um, I want the, I hope, one of the reasons I'm uh, so pleased to be coming here is I want to be as ambitious as we reasonably can and credibly can for the way this is going to go. And I hope that this will contribute to the whole department and indeed the university. That's the idea behind this, not just our little group. So um, my hope is there'll be kind of two-way traffic here in relation to the department as a whole, that we will be bringing in a lot of interesting people people with fresh ideas, m multiple interests, multiple background, and that that will be something that will be of, they, there will be different connections with different components, people who do mind, do science, so on and so forth, meta ethics, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping that it won't just energize our little pocket or our little clique, but it will energize the whole department, not even just the philosophers, but everybody else. And that will mean that I, um, um, we will try and, as it were, structure our um, style and our format socially so that it um, has that impact uh, for the benefit of us all. But our kind of ambitions, I think, are to become a leading center in Europe. This is really, uh, I've discussed this with Gunnar and others when we put this uh, proposal. We, I think this is a completely reasonable ambition. Um, we have the resources. We have millions of krona <laughs> to use. Um, 
I kind of see this as kind of uh, responsibility squared. You, you know, any project that gets that much money, you have a responsibility. But when it's responsibility that you're responsible for, uh, you better get it right, or we could make a headline somewhere. <laughs> Uh, so I will try not to make the wrong headlines, try to make the right headlines with the group that we're with. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I'm hoping that this will uh, be a, a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity for uh, us. And that means aiming at the best research, the best venues, to bring in the best people, to be demanding of one another, and to be engaged. But I think the best way to do that, and I hope our style will be that, is to make it a nice place to be, where people want to be, where people like being here. And I have to say that just in my little 48 hours or whatever I've been here, it seems to be like a very good venue from what I can see. So I am very optimistic, despite my Scottish pessimism, uh, about the possible trajectory for this. So I hope that gives you some idea um, of my own background, who I am, where I've, uh, how I've developed, how I've evolved what my general research interests are, and how they integrate. And hopefully, I can bring something and be um, worthy of the extremely kind uh, nomination and uh, the fact that uh, we're coming here to Gothenburg. So thank you. Tak. Thank you.